Morning guys. I just got back from checking the trap line and it was empty this morning. So what I did was I did a little bit of trap line maintenance. I put a couple more sets in. And what I generally do with my trapping is I like to stay to about a dozen or so traps. And because I'm concentrating on the water line at this point, what I'm doing is I've set traps closer to the cabin. And as those traps sit for maybe four or five days to a week and they don't hit, I move them forward toward the end of the line. And that way I'm kind of leapfrogging traps out further and further away as I go and discover new areas or want to trap someplace different. But only having a dozen traps out makes it very easy to manage the line because there are maintenance aspects of a water trapping line. You've got things that freeze up and have to be moved. You've got rising and lowering water levels, which may mean you have to adjust things like conibears up or down depending on the water level. There's lots of different things that take place on a water line especially that require more maintenance than just throwing out a bunch of land traps for coyote and fox and things like that. So I'm doing that as I go. What I thought I'd do today is I thought I would teach you how to make a drink called kvass which is an Eastern European fermented drink. It's got a very low alcohol content probably 1, 1.2% all said and done. It tastes a little bit like a mead, beer, wine type of drink. Um, it has a good flavor to it, but I think the historical lesson here, which is something I like to do in these series is talk about history, is understanding why there were so many alcoholic beverages consumed back in ancient times, and especially in older European times, and even with sailors aboard ships and things like that in the colonial period, early periods where exploration was coming between Europe and the U.S. and the Europe and, you know, Central South American countries, they carried vat, big casks of wine and things like that on ships for a reason. Fermented drinks didn't go bad. When you were trying to store water, it would go bad over time. You could store alcohol for a much longer period of time without it going bad. And then you could water that alcohol down to drink it, but it would still kill some of the pathogens, bacteria, and things like that in the water. Also, part of the process for making this liquid to begin with involves boiling the water, which obviously pasteurizes it to some point and kills some of the things as well. So you've got things like waterborne pathogens to worry about, but in the old days, especially in Europe and places like that, and you know, eastern areas like Russia, they didn't have good ways of sanitation within towns and villages. So a lot of times your water sources would be suspect, and you could even contract things like cholera very easily from the water. So by using an alcoholic beverage that was not necessarily a high alcohol content, it would take care of some of those things. And then by boiling the water to make it to begin with, you would take care of some of the other things that would be in the water that could be waterborne pathogens like cryptosporidium, giardia, and the things that we worry about today. So that's the really kind of the history behind why so much alcohol in areas, you know, even in Roman times, they drank wine all the time. And obviously Rome being a huge city, they had sanitation issues. So by drinking wine, they could at least mitigate, not necessarily eliminate, but mitigate some of those problems by drinking an alcoholic beverage. So today we're going to make kvass. Stay with me and we'll get started. All right, so we've got about a half of a large bush pot here of water and we're going to start by boiling that water. Okay, on the other side of our stove here, we're going to toast two pieces of rye bread until they're blackened. I'm just going to kind of go about this pretty quick. The flames have turned up pretty high. Okay, once our water's boiling, we can turn the oven off. And what we're going to do is we're going to add to this water about a handful. There's a good measure for you, a handful of raisins. We're going to take a lemon we're going to add two slices of lemon. Then 
Then we're going to put our toast in. Get that kind of pushed down in there. And now we're going to turn the heat off, which we've already done. And we're going to let this sit for three hours. Okay, next step in the puzzle. Once we've let this sit for three hours, we're going to pour off the liquid. We don't want the raisins at this point or the bread. So we're just pouring the liquid off. Good thing about the bush pot is, it's got that spout on it, strain all that stuff off easy enough. Get all that in a large mason jar that we can seal up so we don't let any air in it. Okay. To that, we're going to add two ounces of sugar. We're going to add a packet of yeast here. This is activated yeast. Let me get this thing open. I have to use a knife to get this thing open with. And then we're going to add some more raisins to this. And again, we're going to do the handful thing. Put a good handful in there, just like that. Then we're going to seal this up and we're going to let this sit for three days in the warmest environment we have. Okay, if we all we've got is the cabin and we're not running the stove in it continuously, then we're going to have to just do the best we can. But we're going to put it somewhere warm. You know, warm air rises, so we'll put it as high as we can in the cabin, and we'll let it sit for three days. All right, so today we're facing some of the challenges of a water line. We had a couple straight days of pretty good rain out here, which made all the creek levels rise. Now, they're going back down now. I'm actually surprised they're not froze up because it was really cold last night. It's supposed to get colder throughout this week which is a separate problem altogether with water lines. But this tributary set that we had right here, where you've got this confluence coming in, was just gushing with water yesterday because of this rain that we had. And it's washed that set completely out. So we're gonna have to get back down in there. We're gonna have to reset that 110, that mix set. And that's gonna be a problem all the way down through this line today. And the other inherent issue that you have with pocket sets in general, is that when the water level rises, it will wash your pocket set completely out. It'll wash the bait out of the hole, cover the trap with deeper, deeper water, and you're not gonna catch anything. So basically, until the water goes down, you're at the mercy of those pocket sets catching nothing, and most of your 110s will at least be washed out until you get a chance to reset them. So there are inherent problems with water lines that you don't necessarily have with upland sets, but you have different problems with upland sets with freezing and things like that as well. So We'll just go through here and maintain the line today and then we'll get back after it. All right, so here's a good example. You know, this is one of our pockets right here. And the water levels rose up. See, it's running pretty hard through here. And washed our bait completely out. I just pulled the trap out and just dropped it over the stake. I think this is a good spot. I like this area. So I'm going to leave the trap here, let the water recede, come back in and redo the pocket. But there's no sense in making the pocket higher now and resetting the trap because once the water drops, the trap's going to be exposed. So you just this is the game you have to play with water trapping. Okay, so our kvass has been sitting for three days now. And you can see all the raisins have floated to the top of this thing and the yeast has all dropped to the bottom. So now we're ready to pour it off for storage into smaller like single serving mason jars and we want to strain it as we pour it so I'm just going to put like a shemag any kind of fabric would work for this that was tightly woven but I want to be able to see so I know how much I'm putting in there so I'm going to strain it off into that and then we're going to store it in a cool place you could store it in your refrigerator or you could store it on a shelf in an outbuilding or something like that if you chose to do so but you can definitely smell 
the alcohol in this thing. Get this fabric permeated here. So strain through it better. Call that good for the first container here, so you can see what this looks like. We've got a couple of raisins in here, and we'll get off of it, so we're not trying to pour through those on the next pouring. We'll get rid of those here in a minute. Put the lid on this and show you what this looks like. Well, that's basically what we've got. It's a dark, almost a malt color. Okay guys, so I thought I'd just give you guys a quick taste test on this Kavaz and uh, give you my thoughts. Um, it's got a very sour and tart taste to it. At least this batch does, and I'm sure that they're all different. But that cooling effect of a sour flavor is medicinal in nature. You've got alcohol in here, which makes it medicinal in nature, although it's a very, very low content of alcohol. And that needs to be understood here. The purpose of this video really wasn't to teach you how to make an alcoholic beverage. It was to teach you that the fermenting process is something that was done by peoples all through history to conserve water sources that otherwise may go bad or may contain some type of bacteria or some type of a protozoa that would affect their system and affect their health. Man, that's good. <laughs> Holy cow. Too bad I only made six of those.